Another way you can do that is by joining one of our shared interest groups. And again, we have lists for you at our information desk with contact information. Uh, we've got some wonderful shared interest groups. Another great way to connect with people. I am actually looking for someone who's willing to facilitate a snowshoeing um, shared interest group. My husband and I bought, when, when did we buy our snowshoes? We bought? Years ago. Years, years <laughs> ago, and they're in the original bath. So I need one of you today to step up and be willing to facilitate a snowshoeing shared interest group. Um, so I just wanted to make that point today, that sometimes we all need to even step a little bit out of our comfort zones, but if you take that first step and make an attempt to get involved, I promise you, we will meet you more than halfway, okay? Um, in addition to being the Vice President of Ali, I'm also the co-chair of the membership committee, along with my incredible co-chair. Monica, where are you? Monica, can you wave? Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask for a favor. My um, my committee works very hard putting these things together. Can we have a round of applause, please? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I am now going to start to introduce our incredible lecturers. Megan normally does this, so I'm not going to do it as well as she does. Um, the, um, the first person we're going to have speaking is Gwendolyn Van Sant. She is going to be lecturing on global, oh, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble reading this. The Global Citizen Rooted in the Berkshires. Gwendolyn, are you? Don't be shy. <laughs> Wendelin is the co-founder and CEO of Multicultural Bridge. She is co-curating co the course, which will be held on Friday afternoons in Great Barrington. Good morning, everyone. So I'm new to the Ali community, and I'm really having fun. This is our second year. Um, the course that actually you're doing on Fridays at 3.30 is about W.B. Du Bois. And so, did anyone in here take the course last year? We did the first round of this Du Bois course. We actually had 70 Ali students there. Did anyone take it? That's here? A few of you? Yeah, so um, that was uh, to honor W.B. Du Bois's 150th birthday. Um, and we did it in collaboration with the town of Great Barrington. And really what we wanted to do was celebrate and lift up Du Bois, um, talk about his contributions, allow space for people to explore him as a feminist, and also to talk about what Du Bois's communism really looked like in the time. And um, we just had a really great experience, and so we decided to do it again this year. The theme is global citizen rooted in the Berkshires, because our Berkshire County and Great Barrington has had a history of struggling with honoring Du Bois in his work, and, um, but if you go anywhere outside of Berkshire County, Du Bois is a hero. He's a hero internationally and nationally. Um, right now I'm in a consulting job with a bank, and two of the books we're reading, The Color of Money and The Color of Wealth, Du Bois is referenced throughout them for his um, ideas about economic um, equity and justice. So this time, Randy Weinstein, who's the director of the Du Bois Center in Great Barrington, and myself have co-curated a course of local and um, a few distant scholars, but the first night we have a play again at the Mahaley, just like last year. This play is an imagined conversation between um, Edith Wharton and um, Du Bois, and it was written by um, a woman that was born in the Berkshires and went off to Princeton and other places and has come back to raise her family. But she wrote this play when she went off to college and learned about Du Bois for the first time and figured out he was a contemporary of Edith Wharton, so she imagined a conversation. And that play's been put on many places outside of the Berkshires, and this is the first time we'll do it for the Ollie class, and then it'll be at the Mount later on in the summer. Um, and then after that, we have Dr. Justin Jackson, who's a history professor at Simon's Rock. We have Letitia Haynes, who actually has a law degree, but she's the Vice President of Equity and Inclusion at Williams College. And then we have Reverend Sloan Letman of the Second Congregational Church in Pittsfield, and he is a member of the same fraternity that Du Bois was a member of. And Du Bois is actually considered a saint in the Episcopal um, faith. So we'll be talking and exploring Du Bois on those levels. 
And then Tasha Alston is another native Berkshire person who is now a professor of psychology in Georgia. She's flying back home. Her family's rooted in Great Barrington to speak about Du Bois. And then Dr. Mary Nell Morgan is at SUNY. She's a professor of political science, and Professor Joan Sneed, who's just retired from MCLA, is African American history professor. We'll also talk about Du Bois and again visit him as a fem his ideas about um, black women and fem feminism. So that's the course. And I hope you join us. Six weeks long, and I think that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Howie Barkins. Howie is the former Ali board president and longtime Ali instructor in cooking and films. His latest class, Tuesdays at the Movies Film Noir. We'll be talking about Tuesday mornings and great there Right. Good morning. Uh, the course this year, Tuesday at the Movies, is Film Noir. A uh, couple statements. Film Noir is not a genre. Then what is it? Film Noir is a French term, but has little to do with France. Then what's the connection? And the Cold War and the threat of nuclear annihilation have a lot to do with Film Noir. Really? Why? Now the longest run on sentences in all of history. To get the answer to those three statements and more, and enjoy the screening of the Maltese Falcon, Laura, Notorious, The Killers, and Out of the Past, and learn why these five films out of over 400 classic Phil Noirans were chosen, and enjoy seeing Humphrey Bogart, Jean Tierney, Cary Grant, Burt Lancaster, Ingrid Bergman, Ava Gardner, and Robert Mitchum on the big screen at the triplex Take the film noir course. Tuesday mornings, 10:30, and there will be quizzes and prizes after every film. Thanks. Okay, and next we have Jamie Keller, a retired teacher who loves Latin with all her heart, and is leading reading Virgil's Aeneid in Latin on Wednesdays in Pittsfield. Okay, well it's winter and I'm here again, the fourth time. I can't believe it. what a great group you are that I should be teaching in Latin. This is my fourth time. <coughs> but I did just have to say, I did have to laugh. I didn't do it when I saw the limit of 10 in the class. My God, if 11 of you sign up, you're welcome. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so as usual for those of you um, work with me. I will supply the text, vocab, and notes. Um, please uh, have a Latin dictionary, and since this year it's Virgil, um, the Aeneid. I did Ovid for two years, and then I worked out to Catullus, and now I'm really brave doing Virgil, and hope that some of you um, will join me. Just selections from Virgil's um, and, Magnum Opus, the Aeneid, book four and book six. So very briefly, the Aeneid is a very relevant story because the Aeneid is a story of refugees, okay? Um, it's the Trojan War, the Trojans have lost, um, and they, they have to leave. Troy is literally burning. So Aeneas and his buddies get together, his comrades, <clears throat> along with his father and son, but oops, where's his wife? Oh, she's dead. And she comes to Aeneas as a ghost to say, go, 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 it's time for you to leave because Mercury has come down and said to um, Aeneas and his men, it's your destiny and your duty to find a new land, the promised land, sound familiar, in the West. So off they go. No wife, because really, how can you have the love affair that I'm about to talk about if you had a wife with him? Um, and so he heads out. Book one, books one to six of the Aeneid basically are his odyssey, he and his men. Um, lots of obvious Homeric um, you know, uh, similarities. And so he flees 
and he winds, he's almost there. His father has died along the way, and he's almost in Italy when a storm comes and brings him to the coast of Carthage, where he meets Queen Dido, also a refugee, by the way, and with a little help from the gods, um, they fall in love. And that brings us to book four of Aeneas, the Aeneas and Dido love story. Um, Aeneas um, is there for a year um, until Mercury comes down. Uh, 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 you're in the wrong place. Which he has done several times along the route when Aeneas and his buddies go, oh, look, uh, look, good place, let's build a city. Mm -mm -mm, wrong spot. So he repeats himself um, when he says, what are you doing here? He actually calls him Hanpet. You gotta be going. So Aeneas decides he's gonna try to leave without her knowing. How much does he know about women? And so she sees his um, she sees his men preparing to leave and she goes down to the shore. They have a confrontation. He tells her again it's his duty and it's his destiny. He has to leave. He doesn't ask her to accompany him. Um, and so basically he abandons her. Um, she curses him <laughs> and pulls down an oath. Your people and my people, she says, will always be enemies. May some avenger come along, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but some avenger to fight with your new city. And guess what? That avenger comes along in the form of Hannibal. But anyway, um, Dido's, needless to say, upset. Um, so she builds a funeral pyre, she commits to suicide, and the last thing Aeneas sees as he's um, leaving is the smoke from her funeral pyre. Okay, so um, he's off again for Italy, but first he has to make his obligatory um, trip to the underworld, as all heroes must do. I'm sorry, excuse me. Okay. Um, where he, um, uh, so anyway, he wants to see his dad in the underworld and Pisces, and with the help of the priestess Sybil, he goes um, to the underworld, sees his dad, um, and Pisces is his guide, his mother, and brilliantly, in the case of Virgil, all the, he the future heroes. But if you're a Roman reading or listening, those are the past heroes of Rome. Okay, um, and, and then Anne Pisces also gives a little platonic philosophy, transmigration of the soul, and Aeneas goes through the ivory gates, major discussion, and off he is. Um, so when he lands on Italy, book seven to 12, he must have his um, Iliad, and so he, a war has to be fought over a woman, again, um, and obviously, eventually, he um, takes over. Thank you. Thank you very much. I Thank wanted you. to say more, but take the crap. Take the crap. <laughs> okay. And next we have Tom Hodgson, a new only instructor. Yay! and retired educator will be teaching Aging Through the Ages, the Past, Present, and Future of Human Longevity and Flourishing. It's going to be on Wednesday mornings up in Williamstown. Tom? Hello, everybody. I'm looking forward to having 20 or so people join me for six hour and a half classes in Williamstown to help me figure out what's going on in what looks like to be the final third of my life and, and I assume yours as well. Uh, having spent a career teaching, advising, and coaching students between the ages of 14 and 22, I haven't had a lot of opportunity to think about what aging is all about. I do know we're a young species. Uh, we're only about 100,000 years old, which is nothing compared to other species. And we've tried a lot of ways of organizing ourselves. And 
and, and taking advantage of uh, and, and uh, doing in our aging populations. So I come with a lot of questions I don't have answers to, and this will be a seminar course for that reason among <coughs> others. Uh, why do human beings live as long as they do when they get a chance to? What's, what, what's, what, what sense does that make? How have different cultures over time, hunter-gatherers, agricultural cultures, industrial cultures, and that's only a 200-year span, post-industrial cultures, how have they, in their various ways, uh, understood what it means to grow older? I'm looking to learn as much as I can. There'll be readings. I'll give short talks to frame discussions. Uh, I'll ask the people there to keep intellectual journals so they can record their own thoughts about the readings. And I look forward to learning as much as I can uh, as someone who pursues philosophical understanding. I have a love of wisdom understood as being able to look at the big picture of things and also to seek for uh, practical wisdom, uh, how to apply what you learn in ways that promote good things. Uh, but it also means that in pursuing these things, I admit there's, I mostly don't know uh, the answers and uh, hope to gain as much insight as I can. Thank you. And next we have Bill Cameron. He's an educator and Pittsfield School Committee member. He'll be teaching the God of Philosophers Pro and Con Thursday mornings in Pittsfield, and that is part of our Philosophy Thursday this winter. Thank you. <clears throat> um, in other um, semesters, we've um, looked at the work of a specific philosopher and gotten into some depth with, with it. Um, originally, at least my work with, with all the courses began with reading some of Plato's early dialogues. We spent two semesters actually uh, working through the Republic. And the last course that I did was uh, Descartes' Meditations. Um, I'm proposing a different approach for this course. This is not a course about a specific thinker. It's a course about a specific issue or problem. And the problem is the existence of God. I want to make something clear, based especially on a conversation I had a little earlier here. This is not a missionary uh, venture on my part. Um, we're not looking at uh, a doctrinal notion of what God is. What we're looking at is the way that God is argued for or against by a number of philosophers. We'll be looking at Aristotle, we'll be looking at St. Anselm, we'll be looking at Thomas Aquinas, we'll be looking at Descartes, we'll be looking at Immanuel Kant, and what, we're look, what, what, what I hope we will we'll get out of the readings and discussion is a clearer idea of what God means for these thinkers, what God may mean to any kind of system of thought, and what role God plays in the work of these thinkers. So, if this seems to be of any interest to you, the course will meet on uh, Thursday mornings. I think it starts the 17th of January at the Berkshire Museum. So I hope some of you will uh, come and join us. I've, I've always enjoyed doing these courses. The discussion makes it most worthwhile. So thank you very much. Next is Drew Herzog. Drew is the chair of Pittsfield Human, Human Rights Commission and one of the instructors for Corrective History as a Path to the Future, which is going to be held Wednesday afternoons at BCC. Yes? Hi, my name is Drew Herzog, and I'm going to be one of the presenters at this class. It's called Corrective History. That's sort of a grab bag title. I want to start with a quote from Desmond Tutu, who wrote in his book, No Future Without Forgiveness. The past, far from disappearing or lying down and being quiet, has an embarrassing and persistent way of returning and haunting us, unless it has, in fact, been dealt with adequately. Unless we look the beast in the eye, we find it has an uncanny habit of returning to hold us hostage. So that was Desmond Tutu in his book, No Future Without Forgiveness, about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. And that is essentially what this class is grouped around, the concept of truth and reconciliation. I'm going to be starting with a look at 
Mahatma Gandhi's Satyagraha program and how it affected the human, uh, the civil rights struggle here in the United States. And interestingly about Du Bois, Du Bois was one of the first promoters of Gandhi here in the States through the Crisis Magazine and other articles Du Bois wrote tracking Gandhi's history in, in India and in South Africa, including kind of thing. So there was a long, not just right around the, the civil rights movement Martin Luther King, but right through the 20th century, the African American community was paying attention to what Gandhi was doing in India. So that's going to be part of the discussion. Then Bill Sturgeon is going to be talking about the years he spent in South Africa working with the people around Nelson Mandela during the truth and reconciliation process. So I'll be doing the first class on Gandhi's influence on civil rights. Bill Sturgeon will be doing two classes on the truth and reconciliation process in South Africa. His second class will be discussing what a truth and reconciliation process might look like here in the United States. And then the fourth class will be Pastor Ralph Howe from First United Methodist Church. He's going to be talking about forgiveness, the reconciliation part, because the truth has to lead to the reconciliation, otherwise it's just that ugly truth kind of thing. So he's going to be talking about forgiveness, reconciliation. Will Singleton will be coming to shake us up and saying, well, what are we going to do now? Uh, how are we going to take this moving forward kind of thing? And then the sixth class, ideally, will be a community discussion about what truth and reconciliation means to all of us in our own individual lives and in our lives here as Americans. So it's going to be quite an interesting interactive class. And what's what I, uh, uh, when he was gone, but again, we're, Du Bois is, is part of this sort of thing. The God of the Philosophers, because essentially what we're saying is, how do we act as moral agents? How do we reclaim our moral agency? What are we going to do to bring truth and reconciliation into our lives and into our community? It's going to tie into the class on Hannah Han Arendt and that sort of thing. And even, I love it, it even connects to uh, Mia's going to the underworld, because unless you face your past, unless you go down into the underworld and look at what happened, you can't come back out and forge a new future. You have to, it's again, as, as Santiana said, those who can't remember the past are condemned to repeat that that applies to human psychology and it applies to, to social psychology as well. Um, one last thing, whether you call it, as Gandhi would say, Ahimsa, or in South Africa, Ubuntu, or Martin Luther King's The Beloved Community, it's a way of saying, how are we going to get together and live together as human beings in community? Otherwise, we can't survive here. So it's going to be a really interesting class. You can tell I'm passionate about it. It's exciting to deal with these things based on history, based on human psychology, and based on our capacity to be moral agents. It's going to be Wednesdays, 3.30 to 5 p.m. starting January 16th, somewhere here on the BCC campus. Thank you. Tony Siegel. Uh, Tony's going to be co-chairing the Science Conversations class along with Peter Blum. Um, Tony has an MD from Cambridge University, was a neurosurgeon for 30 years, and he is chairing the Ali Science Committee. Tony. Oh, wonderful. Good morning. Um, I'm co-chair of the Science Committee. My co-chair, Andy Fisher, is here today. Andy, where are you? Thank you very much for your help and everybody else on the committee. Um, the Science Conservation Conversation class uh, that Peter Bloom and I do seems to be very popular. We get the same people turning up year after year. Some people never learn. And <laughs> Basically, we read the Science Times on Tuesday, the science section from the New York Times, and discuss it on Friday. And the job of the audience is to stop me talking, which is not always very easy. But Peter covers superbly the physics and the hard science part of it, and I cover the medical and psychological and other things. But our job basically is just to say, yes, thank you, and okay, yes, and you're next. And it, we, we don't think it's our job, we think it's the audience's job. So the more input we have, the better. Agree, Peter? Absolutely. In fact, if we sit there and just point, it's fine. The audience over the last few years has been terrific. And uh, you're all welcome. There is no limit on this class. And everybody will get to speak. 
If you sit near the front, you do better though, because I've noticed more easily. And the other course we're doing on um, Friday, and the other course in science for the winter, is what we call advances in medicine, that we've been doing now for about six or seven years. Basically, we get practitioners in medicine who talk to us about their specialty, how it started, where it is now, and where it's going, and what the challenges are. And uh, we have uh, five presentations. We start off with two neurosurgeons who are approaching the highest pinnacle of life possible, <laughs> as you realize. Uh, I think the only person here from the group is Dr. Mark Safran, who's going to say a few words about uh, osteoporosis in the beginning of February. Mark, do you want to say a couple of words now? Yeah. Okay. Right. And I'd also like to recognize Dr. Gordon Joseph Josephson, who's helped to uh, arrange some of these classes because he has an advantage on most of us. He's still doing some practice and has contact with real living doctors. And <laughs> we find that interesting. And thank you very much, Gordon. But again, that's again, it's not quite as much question and answer as the science thing, but it's a normal class. But basically, everybody who goes to a medical class wants a free consultation. <laughs> Except the questions always start off, I have a friend who has this severe problem, and it's answered. So whichever way the lectures do it. So we have five lectures, and over the years we've covered nearly every possible specialty. But thank God they're inventing new ones every year. So we keep up. Some of them are cures in search of diseases, but we will keep going. So we encourage you all to sign up and come along and contribute. That's the main lesson and appeal I have here for you today. Thank you. Uh, next is Catherine Kidd. Catherine is a retired professor and chair of our University Day Committee. She'll be teaching about the 20th century philosopher, ha uh, Hannah Arendt, on Philosophy Thursdays at the Berkshire Museum in Pittsfield. Um, Catherine, are you here? No? Right, well, I haven't taken two of Catherine's other courses. I can really recommend that she's a wonderful, wonderful lecturer, and I'm sure you'll uh, get a lot out of that course. Last but not least is Ken Stark, who this semester is teaching Tchaikovsky. I love your titles. He held the key. Good morning, and thank you all for coming. Considering the fact that Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky was being groomed to be a civil servant, how lucky we all were that he decided to for, pursue a, a career in music. Uh, what I'll be sharing with you over the course of the semester will be looking at him biographically, looking at what's going on economically and politically at the time. Why did he write certain things? What was going on that was um, important for him to deal with musically at that particular time in history? We'll play a lot of music. We'll sh uh, a lot of the things that you will look at will be familiar. But one of the things I like to do is share and find compositions that may not be familiar, some more esoteric things that are not played as much in the concert repertoire, um, to introduce you some new things that maybe we would not have heard. The other thing that we'll look at is his very unusual relationship with Madame von Meck, who was his uh, uh, supporter for like 13 years. Allegedly, they never met, but she was his patron, which allowed him to do many of his compositions. And we'll also look at his lifestyle, which is very controversial, as well as the situation surrounding his death, which there still is some possible cover-up from the Russian government on what actually happened during, during his lifetime and his um, 
personal and social life. So um, we'll be meeting on Fridays at the Berkshire Museum from 3 to 4.30, and hope to see you there. Uh, I want to introduce Phil McKnight, who is uh, not teaching a class for us this uh, winter, but who is here for a different reason. Phil is a past instructor uh, for many years at Ali. He has taught uh, Shakespeare and the law and environmental law for Ali uh, on several occasions. And he has proposed, and Ali is undertaking in his suggestion, a trip to England next summer. Um, and uh, you're all welcome to uh, attend. Uh, the t title of the trip is Shakespeare's Shakespeare and the Tudor Age, and it involves a, uh, a visit to Oxford and a visit to uh, Stratford-upon-Avon, and Phil will tell you a little more. Thank you, Peter. This is going to be quite an adventure, primarily because Ollie hasn't done something quite like this before. So we would like very much for you to support us and come with us next July when we do three days in Oxford and three days in Stratford. We leave on Sunday, July 14, and return on Sunday, July 21, so you'll miss only a few of the Tanglewood performances. <laughs> we will spend the first three days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, in Oxford. Some of the highlights will be an even song at Christ Church Cathedral, which is the cathedral church of the city. I've heard this service several times, and it will definitely give you goosebumps when those voices soar into that medieval uh, cathedral. We'll take a look at Blenheim Palace, uh, the home of the Duke of Marlborough from a great nation, where Winston Churchill is buried. And the highlight of the Oxford portion will be two talks from current Oxford Doms, or professors, both of whom are leading scholars in England on Shakespeare. On that Thursday morning, we take a bus up to uh, Stratford, and there we will see, among other things, three productions of the Royal Shakespeare Company. I just checked with the company, and they've announced their schedule for next summer. One of the plays we will be seeing is The Taming of the Shrew, written about 1585, the same time he was writing Romeo and Juliet and Midsummer Night's Dream. We don't know the dates of the start or the end of any of his plays, but 1585 is the generally accepted date for Tammy the True. It also provides the lead actor, Petruccio, with the opportunity to encourage his brand new bride to give the famous ending speech in which she admonishes all women to obey their husbands. A line which clearly sailed in Shakespeare's time, maybe not so much today. The next play we're going to take a look at is As You Like It. That was written about 1599, at the same time Shakespeare was completing Hamlet and Julius Caesar. So this is a bit heavier as a comedy than Taming of the Shrew or Midsummer Night's Dream. You will also get a fashion statement uh, primer. You will learn all about the art of cross garter. Remember <laughs> garters? The third play will be Macbeth. And this is the <coughs> shortest of all his plays, just under 2,000 lines. Hamlet is over 4,000. So it moves quickly along up there in the Scottish Highlands and to my mind, it's always been a costumer's uh, dilemma. What does he or she do with Lady Macbeth in the sleepwalking scene? Because in medieval times, adults went to bed without any clothes. Nevertheless, we'll pursue through that. Uh, we'll also have two talks up in Stratford. One will be from Professor Tiffany Stern, a leading Shakespeare scholar in England. And I know that because she is a co-editor of the Arden Shakespeare one of the three generally accepted best compendiums of his plays. And then finally, uh, and I'm working on this right now with the artistic director of the Royal Shakespeare, uh, she will provide us with a lead actor or director of one of the three plays to give us a little behind the scenes as to how it was put on, and then hopefully take us backstage at one of the three theaters that are still up there. So all in all, it's a, it's a packed trip, uh, but there'll be plenty of time to explore the pubs. One of the most famous in Oxford is the, uh, the eagle and the child, known locally as the bird and the babe, and that'll only be a half a block from our hotel. It's a wonderfully dark, dank, somewhat smelly English pub, but that's exactly the way they should be because they've been drinking beer there since Roman times. And speaking of Roman times, in Oxford, we'll have a drink at the Turf, which is over near New College, a little 
go four or five blocks from the hotel. And when you lean your back against the wall with your pint in the turf, in the main room, you are leaning against a wall built by the Romans. I mean, this is a city of history. Now, we have about 12 folks who have signed up for this trip. We're looking forward to having them come with us. Ideally, another five or six couples would be perfect. The English organizer of the trip says, when you're around 22, 24, 25, that's best for the bus and for dinner reservations in terms of the number of tables that need to be set aside. So Peter and I encourage you, please sign up. We'll be delighted to have you. It'll be a fun trip. You'll learn a great deal about Shakespeare, but also about the contemporary scene in Oxford and in Scotland. So we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, our final speaker is Howard Shapiro, who is uh, a longtime OLLI member and uh, very recently a great help to the board in helping prepare our strategic plan. But Howard is here today to talk about uh, villages in the Berkshires. This is, this is a cooperative agreement uh, that OLLI is helping to promote. Uh, Howard is the promoter of the organization also, and uh, OLLI is trying to help as best we can. Thank you, Peter. I'm not going to tell you a lot about this because on Monday, December 17th, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon at the Berkshire Athenaeum, um, Ali is hosting an uh, information session on villages in the Berkshires and the work that we're doing. To give you a little bit of background, villages have been developing throughout this country over the past 15 years. The first one was in Beacon Hill in Boston, and that has continued to operate. There are now 230 villages across the country and another approximately 120 in development. Ours here in the villages in the Berkshires is one of those in development. There are 16 existing villages in Massachusetts right now and four in development. Villages uh, were developed as a way for people who wish to remain in their own home as they age to uh, stay in their home where they've lived for many years. Uh, they, the organization provides volunteers for various kinds of services as well as negotiating with the service providers in the community to provide their services at uh, discounted rates. We will be moving villages in Berkshire forward this coming uh, year. Uh, we've had a steering committee that's been operating for the past year and a half and we are hoping to begin the initial village uh, in April of 2019. Uh, there'll be more than one village in the Berkshires based on the geography that we have, so uh, there'll be villages developing in other communities as well. And uh, your participation, your interest in this will be very valuable. I'll mention again, there's a, there is a uh, flyer sitting over here on the information about the meeting next Monday. Uh, please do join us and you'll learn a great deal more. Thank you. Thanks, Howard. Uh, before we wrap up, I want to thank the membership committee again uh, for all their work in, in preparing and staffing this meeting. Uh, I want to thank Bob DeRosier over there behind the tripod for filming today. Thanks, Bob. And uh, please remember that you can sign up for classes and join Ollie at the table in the back. Uh, right on right at the head of the stairway. Thank you very much. Uh, hope to see you again soon. At Ali, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College, enjoy learning simply for the love of it. Educational partners Williams College, BCC, Bard College at Simons Rock and MCLA provide some of our outstanding faculty. Take a class in the arts, history, literature, and so much more. Contact Ali today. Meet new friends. Keep your curiosity alive. <laughs>